agencies is from the wildland fire experience. I do uh, fire research and uh, spend a fair amount of time out in the woods. Um, luckily, haven't been involved on a lot of emergencies, but I'm also a uh, Bob, we're not seeing fire. your screen right now. I'm sorry. Excuse me? We're not seeing your screen right now. No slides. Uh, it says... It says you've started, but it's not showing us anything. Screen sharing is paused. Can you see anything now or? No. Okay, let's try it again. We'll, we'll kick start it again. Sorry about that. Okay. You're screen yes. sharing, how's that? Yes, Okay, lovely. now we got it. It's like an old motorcycle, you gotta kick it over a few times to get it to work, so. Uh, so anyway, my experience as a, a volunteer firefighter and a certified first responder, uh, as well as uh, being part of the uh, wilderness uh, firefighting teams uh, has, is where most of this comes from. And I'll have to preface this talk with, this is not training, this is information. If you need to be trained, you have to go to an official source of training, which would be uh, for first aid and CPR, your local uh, Red Cross or, or a firefighting organization. Uh, sometimes the towns will do uh, CPR and, and first aid. Uh, there are wilderness, first responder, wilderness first aid, and wilderness EMT sources that you can access. Uh, they're quite expensive. Uh, there's one given by the Adirondack Mountain Club, uh, usually up in Lake Placid. And so I think it's a week long. It's a wilderness first responder. And uh, there's also, each county has its own uh, first responder, first responder and emergency medical technician training. And these are between 80 and 180 hours of uh, training required. So again, that's the official route. This is strictly informational and uh, some experiential uh, information to share here. So now I have to figure out how to make this advance. Huh, it's stuck. <laughs> oh, there we go, okay. So the goal today is to understand the important factors in uh, in, in wilderness emergencies, medical emergencies, and understand that the most important thing, one of the most important things is a pre-plan. So when you go out into the woods, you have an idea of things like, where's the nearest medical services? Uh, what's the local fire department? Do they have a uh, ATV or UTV that they can get onto a trail with and, and provide uh, emergency evacuations? Also, we need to understand the level of training and equipment necessary for this wilderness medical emergency that could occur. It's not hard, but you have to have some training. And the most important thing is to keep a level head to be effective. And I certainly don't want everyone to panic so they don't go out into the woods again. So I'm an avid hiker and outdoorsman for a long time, uh, while one firefighter and fire researcher all over the country for the last uh, 17 or 18 years. Uh, and like I said before in, our, in my introduction, most of what I talk about will be drawn from the wildland fire experience. I'm also a volunteer firefighter and New York State first responder in Pittsburgh. Been on about 3,000 fire calls and a couple hundred EMS calls. And I've seen and participated in search and rescue and recovery. Uh, rescue is different from recovery, of course. Uh, car wrecks, medical and trauma emergencies, man carry, helicopter evacuations, and I've watched uh, the so-called incident command system, uh, which is a, a structure for firefighting in action on wildland and structure fires. And I've been on a bunch of trail crews, both with the Finger Lakes Trails uh, Conference and the Forest Service and Park Service. Just some uh, goofy pictures. <laughs> so again, this is not a substitute for an accredited first aid CFR, wildland CFR, or EMT course. Uh, I would recommend a first aid course. It doesn't necessarily have to be a wilderness first aid course, but uh, and, and or a possibly a wilderness first responder uh, training. I, I believe the last time I looked at a wilderness first responder courses, they were a week long at about eight or nine hundred dollars. So this is a serious undertaking if you think you need something like this. Uh, you know, it is a serious undertaking. 
And uh, the wildland first responder, uh, wilderness first responder may not be state certified. So even though you've spent a lot of money, uh, you still can't ride an ambulance. It's a different type of training. Uh, again, it, the takeaway is to be pre-plan ahead for possible or likely medical emergencies. Uh, practice CPR and first aid weekly. Just go through the book from the Red Cross and don't panic. Use common sense and do the logical thing. I also ask everybody, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, that the big difference between a wilderness first response and a, a first response in an accident, car accident, or in a, a, an accident, in a, in a, you know, a civilian accident, is that there's no easy way to evacuate somebody out of the woods. And I invite you to try dragging somebody or try carrying somebody out of the woods. It's, it's virtually impossible to do by yourself. Uh, the usual uh, forest, New York State Forest Rangers will have four to six people to, to uh, if they don't have a UTV or an ATV to get someone out of the woods, they'll have four to six people responding to, and these are big, strong guys and girls. And um, it's, it's very difficult to drag somebody woods, out of the woods. So just think about that when, whenever you're uh, hiking. So how do we prepare for a medical emergency? And again, the major difference between wilderness response and other emergency medical response is that help is more than three to 15 minutes away. Most towns, uh, especially in larger cities, I live in Rochester, most towns have a three to 15 minute response to get you to the hospital. So if you're, if you're in trouble, uh, an ambulance will show up, there'll be uh, EMTs, paramedics, a whole uh, cavalcade of equipment, and within three to 15 minutes, they'll either get you to a hospital or get you stabilized you for transport. What? The, the first hour after an injury is telling for both medical and surgical emergencies. And I'll explain the difference between those in a minute. And cool heads must prevail. And you have to prepare as much as you can and practice the skills you need regularly. If you forget how to do CPR and somebody needs CPR, it's not the time to learn uh, when somebody's down. Oops. So the difference between a wilderness response and a conventional first response is an extended contact time. So you're going to be out for some number of hours sometimes to get somebody off, off of a, out of a wilderness situation. It requires more treatment and more stabilization of the patient. You're going to have envi environmental extremes, cold, wind, heat, uh, rain, uh, snow, which could pr pr produce a shock condition. And you have limited equipment. You certainly don't have an, an advanced life support or a basic life support ambulance nearby. There's, and the, the extraction difficulties are the terrain can be difficult. And you know, certainly out west, we have even more mountainous terrain or up in the Adirondacks. The Finger Lakes Trail is, is still bumpy and lumpy. It's, gonna, it's hard to get people out. You have a limited crew. Again, to, to transport somebody, you need six to six to ten people to transport somebody. Any 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 that that can't walk themselves to transport them out of the, the woods, and you don't really have proper gear. You don't have a backboard. You don't have uh, a gurney or any kind of equipment like that to transport somebody. So this is a form, which I list here just as a way to organize your thoughts, and you know you can copy this. Uh, it's, it's called a medical nine line, and it's really nine lines of patient assessment. So, you know, you, uh, if you do get into an emergency situation, and this is used in wildland fire situations, everybody carries a copy of the nine line with them. Uh, and when you communicate, if you, if you can communicate, whether it's via cell phone or a radio mechanism, um, you need to communicate this information to the people who are going to do the uh, extraction and take the person to the, um, to the emergency medical location out, out of the woods. Uh, so there's a level of severity. That's your basic triage. Uh, somebody's in real trouble, somebody's not doing too bad, and somebody can walk out of the area but might have some uh, lacerations or bleeding. Uh, number of patients. You know, is there one patient involved or two patients involved? And what's the, what's the assessment of those people? Where's the location, Latin long, right? So if you have a GPS, uh, it certainly helps the, the rangers or uh, DEC people or anybody else that's involved in the, in the emergency evacuation helps them to find out where you are. Uh, whether you need any additional equipment, uh, splinting, uh, other types of uh, bleeding control, if you need that to be brought in with the people who might be doing the evacuation. 
And if there's anybody on scene uh, that, that can help out with the situation. Uh, six is mostly for wildland fire situations where we're connected by radios, but that would be where you put in your phone number and uh, or two phone numbers. If you have two phones, you know, sometimes one phone works, one phone doesn't work. Uh, any other special hazards? LZ is landing zone if you're going to attempt a helicopter evacuation. And uh, it's not crazy to think about this. If you have an open area and somebody's severely injured, uh, some of the local emergency management departments will send in a helicopter to uh, evacuate. So this, again, this is for planning for your own head. When you go into a situation, whether you're doing a day hike or an overnight or a backpack or, or uh, walking the Appalachian Trail, you need to have an idea about the time frames, ETE, estimated time of evacuation and estimated time of arrivals from and to specific locations where uh, other responders can meet you to evacuate the patient. GPS, uh, phones work with GPS it, sometimes. I, I actually don't know how to get the GPS location off my phone, but certainly people do carry conventional GPS units. Uh, and if, if you're in a multi-day or an overnight situation, where, where can you get to, where can somebody find you uh, that, that's, a, uh, that's well known by people uh, that would be walking the trail, if, whether it is a, a a spike camp is a, is a, a fire, firefighter word for a, an overnight camp that's out in the open, whether you can get a, a hell of spot for a helicopter evacuation. Just things to, as you're walking along the trail, keep these things in your mind as part of your pre-plan, sort of your in-service in pre-plan. And um, the, rest of, the rest of these I won't mention, but you know, they're, they're made for, uh, uh, getting other resources to the area. So emergencies are broadly broken down into medical, which is health related, heart attacks, diabetes, uh, heat strokes, uh, heat, of, heat effects, and surgical, which involves trauma or injuries. And that would be the first thing that if you do communicate with an emergency responder that's going to meet you on the road, that's the first thing. Is this a surgical or a medical emergency? And of course, an incident can be both medical and surgical. You can have a heart attack and then fall down and break your leg, so, uh, or something horrible like that. Uh, it's stupid, but it's critical to, to keep, it's stupid to say this, but it's critical to keep the patient alive. So there are, and there's a prioritization that you have to, have to go through. Uh, in, the, in the conventional world, in the conventional um, EMT world, it's ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation. Uh, that's a little bit different in the, um, and I'll show you on the next slide, a little bit different in the, in the wilderness world. And we have to prioritize what we handle first. There's some things that we, you know, if you have a serious injury, you don't worry about scrapes and bruises. And uh, if you have a broken bone even, but somebody's having a heart issue, you worry about the heart first and you don't think about the broken bone. So you have to prioritize in order of uh, the, the severity of what's going on. And secondary, you have to think about longer term consequences. If you have somebody with a, a wound from a, a, a cut of some sort, you do, you do have to clean the wound out and wor worry about uh, if there's gonna be future uh, problems with infections. So it's, it's good as much as you can to uh, clean out wounds and uh, of course to control bleeding. This is a little card that I carry. It's, uh, I don't even know where I got it from, but. It, this is sort of the priorities for um, wilderness emergencies. Uh, first, to control bleeding. So if you have a massive bleeding, a massive hemorrhage, uh, tourniquets are now, uh, they, for a while they were not to be used and now they are to be used. And you can buy a tourniquet kit uh, that's easy to use. Uh, you can use it, uh, one person can use it. These were developed during the uh, the endless Iraq con conflict. Uh, yeah, so, of course, if you controlling bleeding is the first thing, and then you have to breathe. So, rescue breathing, opening the airway, uh, and these things you learn in CPR: tilt the head back. Uh, if you have a puncture wound to the chest, uh, it's called a respiratory trauma, and 
Uh, something as simple as a baggie with some tape can seal up a, rest, a, a chest wound. And then uh, checking circulation, make sure there's enough blood. Uh, if there was a blood loss, if there's enough, still enough blood uh, to prevent shock. And then, uh, especially in an outside situation, keeping somebody warm. Somebody in shock will be uh, compromised with their ability to do uh, heat management in their body. And the, on, on the back of this little card is uh, what 911 9 9 9 operators will ask of you. Where are you? Uh, in which case, you know, you also include the GPS location if you, if you have that. Uh, is the patient breathing? Uh, did you start rescue breathing? Is there just one patient? And describe what happened. Uh, obviously, it's, we're not going to have a car wreck or a shooting in the, in the uh, <laughs> in wilderness, but uh, somebody could be burned in a fire. But this, you know, of course, they're going to ask about that. Are there any special considerations for EMS uh, so they can uh, dispatch the right equipment to your pickup point after you evacuate the patient from the wilderness situation? Uh, the rest of the stuff is your name, of course, your name and phone number. Uh, they're going to ask that for follow-up. Oops, I went too far here. So again, control bleeding, do a patient assessment, what, whether they're, you know, the initial assessment is what's, what's the, what can you see immediately? A focused assessment, you go from head to toe and you understand, uh, is there something else that's hidden that's causing uh, injuries? Uh, you can have a hidden broken bone, you could have a distortion of a, of a leg or arm, which has a bone broken underneath. So, but the initial assessment was the patient's down and uh, focused assessment would be going head to toe. Uh, control of shock, of ABC, airway breathing circulation, that's covered in CPR and first aid. And I strongly advise everybody to take a CPR first aid course. They're a few hours long. Uh, there's some of them that are online now. Uh, I'm not sure if Red Cross is, is doing uh, in, in-house or in ambulance uh, facility uh, training anymore. I'm not sure if they are in Monroe County. Uh, it's a sort of phase four. Control of shock, which is a shock is caused by a lack of circulation or correct circulation of blood and other bodily fluids. And treating other hard and soft tissue is injuries, mostly for our purposes means a stabilization. So if you have a suspected head injury, wrap a towel around the neck, or some sort of thing so that you can uh, stabilize the neck. Uh, fractures, again, a splinting, a splinting operation to prevent pain. We're not gonna medically treat people, we're just gonna reduce um, motion and uh, enable patients to be transported. And then transporting injured, which is called, which is called in the business packaging. A big question is how do you handle your own head? I remember the first time I was on a CPR call, it was just a few streets from my house, and the, this man was down, and um, I started to do CPR, and uh, that was about 15 years ago. I, I still remember it, and the, the, the person uh, didn't make it, but uh, you have to be able to, you have to handle your own head first. You have to be able to think clearly, and you don't, you shouldn't think about what happened, but what has to happen next. And, and usually that means, you know, again, all the things we just talked about, stabilizing the patient and eventually packaging them to get them out of the wilderness situation. And, you know, it's, it's really difficult to not get emotionally involved and especially harder in our case, because we're going to be out hiking with our friends and we know the people on the scene. We know, we know the person that's injured that, you know, fell down, broke their leg or whatever happened. We also have to be able to, be calm enough to think creatively because the problem is going to be difficult. Getting somebody out of the woods is difficult and you have to figure out how to do that in the easiest way that produce, produces the least damage to the patient. If more than one patient, again, triage, take care of the most, person, most needy person first. Uh, and remember, first of all, to contact the forest rangers, uh, local fire department, EMS, 911 will dispatch all those people to an emergency situation. And Again, part of your pre-plan, do you have cell coverage in this area? Is there any way to get communications? Or 
can you walk a uh, half a mile to a ridge top or can you do you know where you can get cell coverage from to access uh, other emergency responders over and over in uh, first responder training you learn scene safety uh, so see safe scene safety is uh, is it safe for you to go and access the patient or are you going to put yourself in harm's way uh, BSI, body substance isolation, gloves, mask, eyeglasses, uh, especially in these COVID times. Although you're going to be hiking with your friends, so I assume that these people will be, uh, your, your, your patients will be people that you know most of the time. Uh, and again, the mechanism of injury is something that will be reported to the EMT, and you should probably write this down. Uh, and the chief complaint would be for a medical thing, is there chest pain? Is there you know, a back pain that doesn't seem to be caused by uh, a blow or a, a, a surgical problem, but some other kind of medical problem? And the ABCDE, airway, breathing, circulation, uh, stabilizing the spine and uh, the last thing in the initial assessment is to expose the person to uncover any hidden hidden things, uh, uh, you know, heavy bruising, uh, distortion of the body. And again, these things will be, you'll, you'll tr treat these as far as you need to, to package the patient and get them out, but you'll report these to the EMTs and paramedics on the scene at the site of the evacuation. Again, handle the most severe threat first. The cervical spine, if there's any problems with a neck injury, use a rolled up towel, clothes. We're not gonna carry C-spine collars, but a SAM splint, and I'll explain what that is later, it can be used for a number of different purposes. It's one of the things I always carry with me. Is the airway open, patient breathing? Again, these things are all covered in CPR class. Uh, I would recommend, instead of using a CPR dummy, trying a, on someone. That's not a dummy. Uh, <laughs> heads are kind of creepy feeling. Moving somebody's head back and opening their airway, uh, you really have to do it on a, on a human. So you take somebody you know and, and try fiddling around with their head and, and to, to see how do, you, how do you open the airway. You can actually see when the airway is open. And of course, you know, knowing if the person's breathing, it's, it's uh, can a patient talk? If not, look, listen, and feel. And again, these are all covered in the first, first, first aid courses. If somebody's down uh, with uh, no pulse, no respirations, you start CPR. And you don't stop CPR. That's, that's the general rule. And the current thing is that rescue breathing is not really important but CPR is. So you go as fast as you can for as long as you can. And that is very, very tiring. So the recommended now by uh, both the American Heart Association and Red Cross is about 120 uh, strokes per minute on a CPR, uh, a couple of inches of depression of the breastbone, and to keep it going without any breaks. You, you need to have a lot of people. And if you if you can imagine you're trying to do CPR on somebody that you're also trying to evacuate, it's virtually impossible to do something like that. And again, uh, for, as far as circulation goes, you should check for bleeding. Uh, if the person's on the ground, they might be bleeding underneath and you can't see it. So you have to roll people around and feel with a gloved hand. And don't forget underneath the patient, there could be some wounds there. Shock is the failure of the body circulatory system. And there can be uh, lots of shocks you know, caused by blood loss, uh, internal, external. Uh, could be low blood volume due to a bleed out anaphylactic during, during you know, allergic reaction. And also you can get scared into shock. Uh, and that usually people recover from that without treatment. And uh, so the symptoms are, are down there. And I'm not sure if this is covered in CPR, uh, but these are things that are, if you have somebody with a rapid weak pulse and, and cool pale skin that's turning blue, you have a really serious situation. And again, that should be reported to the to the, uh, any re any other res responders, uh, but there's really not much can be done. You, know, you elevate your feet, elevate the patient's feet, keep them warm. There's not much can be done for shock situations in a wilderness situation. So uh, 
one thing they will ask you uh, as if you do get in, in, uh, in touch with the 911 uh, response is, is uh, the le level of consciousness. So alert, verbal <laughs> means they respond to a verbal command. If they respond to pain, you roll your fingers across their breastbone. If they move around, that means pain. And then as unresponsive as the last, they'll, they'll ask you the level of consciousness. Uh, so that's something that you, you should be able to report to uh, your responders. You should be writing everything down if you can to help the first responders. And if the patient's conscious, ask about what, what hurts the most. What's the chief complaint? Look, ask, feel. Feel for softness, hardness, deformities of things that don't look right, dislocations. Uh, I think in, in the wilderness injury world, the biggest issue is uh, sprains, strains, and broken bones. And, uh, okay. Uh, I skip it. This is popping here. Okay. Uh, so getting a seriously injured patient to the hospital is the most important part of the rescue. Of course, they have to be alive. And whenever you go into a wilderness situation, you, can th you should think of how, how are we going to get people out of here? Um, most rural fire departments now have uh, UTVs and ATVs to extract people from uh, uh, injury situations on trails. But is it possible to get an ATV up this trail? If not, you have to think about how would you get the person to <clears throat> a part of the trail where they can be extracted. And if you have enough people, as soon as someone may be injured, maybe that maybe you should have one person go and help seek help for an evacuation. Because e even if you're on a trail <clears throat> many times, telling people where the closest trailhead is without GPS coordinates could be difficult, but if you do get to the trailhead, you can, you can flag the first responders down. And in many places along the Finger Lakes Trail, there's no cell phone coverage. There's definitely no radio coverage. And e even people that live in the area might not have a good knowledge of where our trail crosses or, and, and certainly has no idea where the injured party is. So sending someone down to uh, a, a pickup point where other responders can respond to the to the injury is a lot is a great idea if you have uh, four or five people around so you know the, there's various levels of um, extraction if somebody can walk out if you have two or three people you can help somebody with an injured leg hobble out it's going to take a long time uh, but you can do that a one person carry, you, need, you can only carry somebody, uh, even a strong person can only carry somebody that's uh, about their weight uh, a very short distance. So you need 16 or, or more rotations per mile in easy terrain to extract somebody. With a two person carry, and it's a bunch of two person carries that you can practice, uh, most of them look like uh, arms joined and, and the injured party sits in between your two arms that are joined. And again, eight rotations per mile, that's, that's a long way to, to walk with somebody that's in that position. And, uh, it, you know, it, you should try practicing these things. It's, it's incredibly difficult to move somebody. Uh, a lot of, there's a lot of uh, Boy Scout books uh, and things about how to, how to make a litter uh, with poles and sticks or webbing or clothing. Uh, it's, it's relatively impossible to do that. Uh, most of our evacuations, and if you read the, the um, forest rangers reports, which are available on the DEC website, most of our evacuations in New York State are vehicular evacuations with a UTV, a snowmobile in the winter, or an airlift with a uh, helicopter. So even, even if you have a UTV, if it's bumpy, the patient needs to be padded with as much clothes as you have around and strapped down so they don't flop around. Most UTVs that are provided by local fire departments or the, the forest rangers will have a, a, a Stokes basket or a backboard or gurney where a patient could be strapped in 
so uh, they're just not in terrible pain every time the UTV bounces around. Uh, it's essential to keep the patient warm. Even in the summertime, if there's some loss of blood, the patient can get shocky and, uh, and fail that way. This, uh, any, any suspected breaks should be splinted. And I'll, I'll show you a, a, a one way to do that with a, a commercial product called a SAM splint. And it's, uh, yeah, it's ass busting work to drag somebody around. But for a fun Saturday, try moving a friend down a trail for a half mile, given any gear you might have on a day hike. And you'll find that it's relatively impossible to move somebody without a, a big mob of people. So again, our UTV, our uh, UTV or vehicular evacuation is, is probably the way we're gonna uh, transport a patient if it's more than a half a mile from, the, from a road. So I'm often asked, what, what, what kind of medical kit do you carry on a fire? What kind of medical kit do you have in your, in your fire department truck? Uh, and I, I think training and a cool head is more important than a medical kit, but you do need to have a few little items that can make things easier. Uh, there's all sorts of kits you can buy. I don't seem to like any of them. Uh, they have a little bandages and things that you just don't need. Uh, you need things to control bleeding and you need things to splint people and, uh, and maybe to uh, wash wounds out, but you don't need, really need much more than that. So this is sort of what I carry around when I go on a fire. There's some crazy sticky tape, which I, I can't remember the name of it, but it's uh, very, very sticky. An ace bandage, <clears throat> this thing called a SAM splint, some uh, big bandages that you can use to stop bleeding. You just press that against the wound and then maybe tape it down and uh, a scissors to cut clo clothing off to get to a, a, a injury site. And this is a, a, a syringe that's used for uh, cleaning out wounds. And again, cleaning out a wound is important, but stabilizing the patient with a splint, stopping bleeding, and again, an ACE bandage is a great thing, or an elastic bandage is a great thing to stabilize a wound, uh, to even to strap a... Uh, uh, a compress onto a wound to prevent or you know stop bleeding. So that's the four categories: things that are sort of like cleaning wounds out on the bottom, stopping bleeding, and splinting uh, an injury. This is a a tourniquet. Uh, again, uh, ten years or uh, ten or fifteen years ago. Tourniquets were not to be used ever. Now a tourniquet is a go-to thing and they have these things that you can actually put this on yourself uh, and to control bleeding in an extremity. And uh, it's, much, it's much more important to control the bleeding than to uh, worry about problems uh, with blood flow to the extremity. And right, right on the tourniquet, there's some information about you know, releasing the pressure every 20 minutes or so. Uh, but you just wind this around and this you twist this thing uh, here and uh, that will tighten up the, um, the elastic band so it stops the bleeding on the extremity. And of course, the, the tourniquet has to be above the extremity. Uh, this is that thing, the SAM splint, which, uh, let's see, over here. It's this little package and it's uh, a piece of foam wrapped around some soft aluminum. And it's easily moldable. And you, that in combination with a uh, elastic bandage, you can, you can splint most any kind of uh, injury. And this is the instructions for the SAM splint. It comes in and you can use it as a, as a cervical collar. You can use it for a upper arm injury. You can use it for a lower arm injury. It's, the bigger ones are big enough to be used to, to brace a whole leg, just a couple pieces of tape or you can wrap it around the bottom of a foot. And um, I actually saw somebody on a fire walk around with a pretty beat up foot with one of these SAM splints on and just a sock over the top of the whole thing just to keep, uh, um, keep it a little more comfortable to walk on. His foot was swollen enough so he had to take his boot off. But uh, uh, these, these SAM splints I think are a great thing to have. They're about 12, 15 bucks. And, uh, Luckily, I've never used mine, but it's, like I said, it's a very p simple thing. It's a piece of uh, aluminum, soft aluminum wrapped with foam. So you can use it in one of about a million ways here. 
This is uh, making a stretcher. I, I show this strictly for amusement purposes. I don't think, I, I just don't think this is reasonable <laughs> to, be, to do. Uh, and, and like I said, I've picked up enough stretchers and regular stretchers in my fire career that uh, you, you need four people to pick somebody up and to try to do it with a couple of shirts or something like this. This is from the, you know, probably the Boy Scout handbook, but it's strictly for amusement. Washing the wound out, this is irrigation, not an injection. Uh, irrigation syringe is just a syringe with uh, no needle on it. And it's, it's great to squirt some high pressure, higher pressure water into a wound to clean it out before you bandage it up. Uh, especially in our situations, we're gonna have a lot of, most likely have soil and uh, other foreign matter in the wound. And uh, of course the hospital will clean this out too, but it's good just to, to do this. It takes a few seconds and you can use water or water mixed with uh, an antibiotic like povidine. Uh, so, you know, really, this is, this is all I ever carry around. Some bleeding control, big compresses. Two by two is an eye patch. If you get something, if somebody has a really problem, you know, it's a small thing. And if you need a two by two uh, compress, it's, it's a small wound that you really don't have to pay attention to in, in a first response situation. Uh, butterfly bandages are just pieces of tape. You don't really need those. You can use adhesive tape. The Israeli bandage is a, uh, a tourniquet that you can put on by yourself. And the blood stop goop is a little kit that's sold by a number of manufacturers that uh, has a clotting agent in it. So you pour the clotting agent into the wound and you wrap it up and it, uh, it's, it, it'll stop the bleeding uh, even on a fairly large wound. And, and again, these, these are things that were developed by the military uh, for you know, severe injuries, gunshot wounds and things like that. EMS scissors, I don't know if you know what EMS scissors are. They're about four bucks and you can cut a penny in half with them. Uh, they're, they're really great tools. Uh, tweezers for things stuck in people's eyes uh, or you have to be very careful when you do that. But sometimes there's a foreign object in the eye, you need a tweezer. Water bottle is, is good enough. You don't need an eye wash kit. Sam Splint I'd hi highly recommend along with a little irrigation syringe, you know, 50 cc or 20 cc syringe to wash a wound out and lots of tape and ace bandages. I mean, tape is great for blisters and all other, other sorts of uh, problems that are not really medical emergencies, but just good to have in your pack. Yeah, gloves disinfectant. Yeah, this is all definitely secondary. And uh, even, uh, I don't know if people carry Vicodin, but you know, even some, some ibuprofen or something can really make it easier for somebody to get out of the woods. Uh, if they have a, a, a fairly minor injury, an ankle injury or something like that, you know, for, for uh, Advil uh, are uh, very good for uh, reducing uh, uh, inflammation immediately. Well, that's about all I have. And uh, I'm open for any questions and discussion. Uh, again, this is not training. This is just uh, advice and uh, probably a, possibly a source for uh, future exploration for everybody that's uh, listening in. I have some, uh, oh, what happened? I had some more things. Uh, Chinook Medical is a place where you can get medical supplies. Uh, and these, these are all resources for, uh, from various federal organizations. Uh, for different types of uh, medical emergency, handling different types of medical emergencies. So with that, I'll try to open it up to the screen. We have, it looks like we have 95 participants, which is fabulous. And I'll shut, stop sharing my screen. And everyone can just unmute yourself if you do have questions. Um, I, I neglected to mention when we started to post any questions you had as we went along in the chat area. Um, so we don't have any questions in there, but I did want to share one piece of information that David Comstock shared. He said the American Red Cross is currently not offering any in-person classes, but That's you can bookmark their website for updates as things evolve. So just that piece of information to share. Nobody wants to pipe up. <laughs> 
I see someone posted a question about how to deal with ticks, tick removal. They deal with ticks, you uh, yank them out. <laughs> there's, a, there's a bunch of tick removal tools. The tweezers works fine. You just gently pull on them. And uh, if you can save the tick, that's a great idea. But, uh, you know, I, I've been treated, I'm out in the woods all the time, and I've been treated for uh, Lyme disease, but I'm not sure if I had it or not. They just sort of give you two weeks of doxycycline uh, as a precautionary measure, usually. And we did offer a, a whole tick workshop on July 2nd, um, which we neglected to record. So we don't have that available on our YouTube site, but um, we are gonna hopefully offer that presentation again in the fall. So if you're interested specifically in learning about ticks, um, that's a good presentation to go to. So keep an eye out for a fall date on that. Bob, what about uh, bee stings? These things, well, if you're susceptible, you should carry an EpiPen um, and you should tell people that you're hiking with how to use it, where to stick you with it. And, um, you know, that's, that's the only advice with that. Uh, again, if you go into anaphylactic shock and you don't have any, anything else, you're on hard times. <laughs> so do you carry an EpiPen or do you expect the hikers to do that? No, I, I don't have a prescription. You need a prescription for that. So you have to go to your doctor and that's a local thing you get locally. Uh, in our fire truck, of course, we have a bunch of basic medical supplies. We have EpiPen, we have uh, uh, Narcan for in case you happen to do a heroin overdose on a trail. But we <laughs> we don't we don't really even as an EMT a an advanced EMT, you're not allowed to give any drugs aside from oxygen is a drug, and uh, you can't even give somebody an aspirin. So you have to hand them the bottle. So the, the, the uh, what, we're, what we're able to do legally is, is very, very little. So uh, anybody who has uh, allergies should carry their own EpiPen. So the, uh, Bob, the Benadryl, um, topical or tablets or both? Yeah, uh, Benadryl works great for, it's a, you know, it's an antihistamine, so it'll, it'll prevent some, some level of problems. Uh, the topical stuff is great if you're itchy works well. It's great for mosquito bites. I have grandchildren. I'm always smearing them with that stuff all the time. And it also, uh, it's good at nighttime, make you fall asleep, even if you just yeah. don't have any, any problems. Yeah, nighttime Advil is, is basically Benadryl plus ibuprofen, so. Hi, Bob. Um, I'm always hiking alone. I've only hiked with a partner maybe three times. And what is the absolute best stuff I can keep in my day pack and still be able to carry the day pack? Well, it's also what you can do yourself. So, you know, I'd put a Sam splint in there and an ace bandage and uh, some of this crazy tape, which I can't remember the name of, but it's, it's just the stickiest stuff. It'll practically pull your skin off. Uh, I should go find out what the name of it is, but I, I can post that. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's brown tape that's incredibly sticky. It's almost like Gorilla Tape for your body. Yeah, I was going to say, would, would duct tape work in a situation too if you couldn't find anything else? Tape is, is the most useful thing. I mean, you can make okay. a tourniquet out of it. You can you know, un, you cut it off w with your pocket knife if you want to release a tourniquet. You can use it to hold a, uh, a compress on a wound. You can tape your leg up so you can hobble out if you twist your ankle. It's, it's really the best all around thing to carry, roll of tape. Yeah, I don't like those medical kits either. I, I emptied it all out and I, I bought a bunch of big bandages because I thought the same thing. You got to stop the bleeding, basically. Yeah, nobody cares if you have a, you know, you got a little thorn in your finger and you just, yeah. you, know, you, you need something big and lacking that, you take your shirt off and you can use a piece of any kind of rag. I mean, it, sterility, sterility is interesting, but if you're yeah. bleeding to death, stopping bleeding is much more important than sterility. Okay, thank you. So a sanitary pad and bat wrap will do the trick. Absolutely. Hey, Bob, what, what's been your experience with people who've used spots or Garmin in reach? If you have any experience with getting a call from, you know, from that service? Uh, I was down, 
uh, for 11 days last February, not this February, last February in the lower Colorado River doing a fish count. And uh, we had a Garmin inReach and it worked really well. Uh, so I was 11 days without any, any contact with anybody except the inReach. That worked really well. Uh, I, on a previous trail work trip, we were in a slot canyon with a, uh, a sat phone and it didn't work long enough to do anything because the, the satellite overpass is a, is a minute. It takes 20 seconds to connect. So you get like four, four syllables in and it disconnects. So the inReach uh, seemed to work really well. And we, we were in a very narrow uh, canyon in, on the lower Colorado River. And that, that worked really well compared to a sat phone. Uh, the spot and the other things, I'm not sure about those. The only thing I have experience is the Garmin inReach. So did you use that in an emergency situation or were you just sending messages to other people to let them know when you were going to arrive someplace? Well, we were, we were in a fixed location for 11 days and uh, it was just a way to contact. It was for Fish and Wildlife Service. So, you know, we had a, a paid person and a couple of volunteers and um, they just want to make sure you're still alive. And it was, oh, it's helicopter access only. So it was helicopter in, helicopter out. So uh, they wanted to make sure if somebody got hurt, they would... Uh, dispatch the helicopter. So it, it was a daily thing, a daily check-in. Okay, and it, it's text messages. And I think there's a variable rates. You know, you can get 30 messages for a month or a hundred or none or something like that. So it, it's, it, and it, and if the fee changes based on how much messaging you have. Right. You know, I have one. I just hadn't used it for emergency. Hope I never do. But I, I didn't know if you'd ever had to respond to that and how it just worked from a dispatch point of view nope. just, uh, just use it for communication purposes in a very remote area All right thank you okay well thanks right. for everybody's kind attention yeah thank you all for for coming it's just eight o'clock so i'm going to stop the recording but we will um post this on our YouTube channel if anybody wants to revisit it and we'll get that shared with anybody who wasn't able to attend. But thank you, Bob, so much. Uh, we really appreciate it. And thank you all for registering and for coming. Yeah, Roger's doing a clap. Everyone's muted. So we- Thank you know, very much, Bob. Really good. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Have a good night. <clears throat> thank you.